tous. Euh, nous avons le grand honneur aujourd'hui de recevoir le professeur Luis Cuevas qui va nous parler de tuberculose. Uh, he will speak in English, I guess. So it, it is really a, a great honor for us and, and a pleasure to welcome here today. He's probably one of the men who knows TB tuberculosis the best in the world. And I'm not I'm not exaggerating. Uh, Luis is uh, the head of the Department of Clinical Science in, uh, at uh, the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Uh, yesterday, we, well, we, we, we all very well know him for his work on in TB. We also know that he, he, he works also on a lot of other diseases, uh, infectious diseases causes of fever, especially in Africa, but not only in Africa, also in, uh, in, in Latin America and, and, and many places. So I will not be long, I will leave the floor for about 30 or 40 minutes. And, and then we will have some time to, to ask a few questions and, and to have a discussion with him. Thank you, Luis. Okay, so, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to come today and it's a pleasure to be here. It's my first time in Bordeaux academically. I, I might have passed here on holidays but then you probably wouldn't recognize me with a t-shirt and, and uh, probably more sweaty in the summer. But it's, it's uh, really nice to have the opportunity to come and I hope that uh, I can tend to you sometimes to come to Liverpool. It's a very nice city, very friendly and we have a, also a, an institute that I'm sure that we have many things in common and that we should maybe try to explore whether there are possibilities to, to work together. Okay, so I am going to talk today, or I'm going to do a bit of rambling, we say. We are going to, I'm going to share with you a bit of my thoughts or how I got into tuberculosis and then uh, what has happened maybe a long, long time ago, uh, why we started to think of diagnostics, uh, and then how uh, really diagnostics to me it happened more and more, it's more, more and more evident that that's, in fact, it's not the solution, but it's part of the problem. And I'm going to end up by showing you how we have tried to use a bit of, of public health and health systems to try to uh, uh, improve some of the problems we have for, uh, uh, increasing the detection of, of tuberculosis. Can you all hear me? Is that, is that all right? Okay. Okay, so just to, uh, I hear that the audience is very varied. So I want to just to reflect that this tuberculosis, many people in Europe especially, think that tuberculosis is a, is a problem of the past. I think it's, it's very evident to us that, that tuberculosis is the main cause of adult infectious death yeah, in, in the world. So last year it was estimated that there were nearly 2 million deaths due to, uh, to tuberculosis alone. Most of them in adults. Although I, I guess Oliver will tell us in a few years' time that that's not true, that they, a high proportion of them in children are undetected. And we also estimate that there's about more than 10 million cases, new cases every year. So there's a huge number of, of cases <coughs> in the world. What, what we is, is very staggering that is that from that estimated number of cases, we miss about uh, 4 million of them. They are never reported. They are never access, and they never access treatment, or they, if they access treatment, they do uh, in maybe with uh, private practitioners that they don't have the standard treatments that they should receive. So there is a huge number of cases that we know that they are occurring, and often what happens is that they don't, we don't know where they are, where, where they are, and what treatment they receive. <coughs> in a way, it's not surprising because this is. <coughs> tuberculosis is a disease of poverty. Yeah, most of them occur in what we call high burden countries. These are, most of them are, are they have very huge populations so, or have a very low income. So it's, it's, not, it's not surprising that then <coughs> people who are, are missed are more likely to occur on slum areas, uh, areas that are not planned, or rural areas, or individuals that for one reason or another they have find it difficult to access services. So, for example, people who live in, who are in prison. So, 
There are many, many barriers that are not biological. Many of them are social, geographical, and so on, to access really to reach a diagnosis. So, it's, it's a, we WHO has done quite a lot of work recently to identify what are high-risk populations, and not surprisingly, many of them are uh, children that uh, Oliver know because it's difficult to make the diagnosis, elderly because they don't <coughs> they they think that having cough is part of the of getting old, they don't have a perception that they could be TB, and so on. But also there is a, also the services are not accessible. It's very difficult to go to the health center, especially if you are in a, in a rural area. In, in, to, in Ethiopia, for example, access to health service mean, means to have a health service that is within 15 kilometers. So 15 kilometers in an area where they, the road infrastructure is, is fairly poor is really often a, a, a day to, to just to go access the, the clinic. Yeah? So there are many, many of these barriers. And the diagnosis often takes a long time. So these are colleagues from the patients from Yemen waiting anxiously to have the results. They have been coming there. We have been asking, how long have you been coming? Two, three, four, five days. And not surprisingly, many of them just say, I just have a cough. I'm not coming back. And this is an expensive process. So it takes very long because our diagnostics have been very poor. For over 70 years, we used slightly better, more modern versions of this microscope, but it was really a smear microscopy. And the smear microscopy, you had to see the, the, this, and then you, say, you had to say, we, will, we found the bacilli. Yeah? But that found the bacilli was very technically defined. Yeah? It, it said you had to have three sputum samples collected over three different occasions, uh, and then you had to have two of the, those smears that were positive. And to be positive, they had to have 10 bacilli, each one of them. So it was fairly technical definition of that. And but at the same time, the sensitivity, having done three sputum samples, was only about 40, 50%. So in some cases, in some places, higher. But in, in, on average, it's about, we miss about half of the patients. So not surprisingly, quite a lot of the uh, health staff will say, OK, you have negative smear microscopy. We will treat you for TB anyway. Yeah? So that's the very often what happens. So, uh, but obviously, if any of you who work on public health, this is really not <clears throat> a screening test. So it has high specificity but very low sensitivity. And the screening test, it should be completely the opposite. OK, so then uh, uh, the, clinic, the, cli the clinicians will say, OK, you, you have a negative smear microscopy. Let's do an X-ray. Yeah. And I think well, those of you coming to the uh, defense from Olivia today, uh, you will see that next uh, rays are really not a very ideal tool. Yeah? First, if you ask one, one person to read it and it gives you a diagnosis, you ask the next person, it has a 50% chance of giving you a different diagnosis. So that really means that that's not a tool. Yeah? This is a, a way to justify for you to make the clinical decision, but really doesn't really add much information that is, is useful. So it has a very low specificity, and it has a sensitivity that is not very high. And uh, currently, we are trying to automate it, to digitalize, and then to do uh, um, the programs to try to read it automatically, which is an improvement. But again, this is still not a screening test. Again, we had culture, and culture, if you, if you had a good timing, it would be a good screening test. It has a very high sensitivity, 97%. If you take two, it would be even higher. It has a fairly good specificity. <clears throat> but this, the problem is that this is slow, and the, the solid culture takes weeks, it takes months to give you the, re the results, and the uh, liquid culture, it takes a, a, sometimes a week or two weeks. So a patient, to, to, if you tell them, you may be very, you are ill, but you just come in a week. Often these people don't, don't wait. Yeah? So it's really the use is currently is really limited to drug resistance and to identify difficult cases. So in the last 20 years, this is very recognized as this is a major priority in, in, uh, in WHO and 
in many other international bodies. So there have been many efforts to try to improve the situation. And uh, so how can we optimize the diagnosis that we already have and how we can we develop new diagnostics? So uh, the, so 10 years ago, and this is when I started to get more involved in this, and uh, I, I, we were thinking in, in my office with some colleagues, how do we optimize this spare microscopy? And then can we do it faster? Can we make it more sensitive? And we have, I, I'm going to leave out some of the uh, ideas we had that didn't work. But one of them was <coughs> that whether we did three samples. Initially, about 50 years ago, they said you have to collect three samples in the morning. Yeah? So that's what they call the morning samples, because the idea is that in the morning, if you have been out, if you were out last night, you probably recognize that in the morning you have a thicker sputum that you needed to uh, get rid of that. In the, in the day, it clears. Yeah? So that's why the idea is that the bacilli is more concentrated in the morning. So they were called uh, uh, morning sputum. But then after some time, it was decided that you could collect some of them in, on the spot. So we call them on the spot and morning sputum. So uh, over the years, we said we collect three samples as a spot, morning spot. The problem is that then <coughs> the patient comes over, over two days. And then uh, you, you start to think of if the patient doesn't return the, se the second day, we have missed the patient anyway. It doesn't matter how many we have collected. Can we do it faster? So one thing that we found was it, it was uh, possible to eliminate the third spot. Yeah? Why is that? If you find all the positives, the third one only adds 5% of the positive samples. Yeah? But if at the same time we are losing 10% in the second day, it is, it's, it's really semantics. Yeah? Is logically, we want to have as many patients diagnosed here and, and not here. And if we could do it with less samples, we, we, it's, it's all right to do that. So it was agreed that we could eliminate the third sample. But you probably are uh, aware that this is still a two-day process. Yeah? We haven't really gained anything. We have gained, we have reduced the workload and possibly uh, the lab will be happy, but the patient will still be complaining. They have to come two days. So we had th another idea, is that if you had these three, and we, and we have found that in, we have a spot morning spot. The spot means that the patient is there, you ask them to produce a sputum there, on the spot. Yeah? OK, let's, let's move that one here. Why do we collect the second spot on the second day? Could we collect it the same the first day? Yeah? OK, now, using the logic that we only need two, then I can just remove the third, the third spot. So now I have a same-day smear microscopy. Yeah? So that's, that's what the first thing that we did. Yeah? Second thing is, let's review um, what happened with, sorry, let, let's review what happened with the, with the bacilli. I'm just going to go back to this one. Sorry. Um, and then we did, a, uh, we did a clinical trial to demonstrate that the same day approach was equivalent to the, to the two day approach. And why is that? We have to do a clinical trial on that. Because in WHO, say, we don't have evidence to that. Over 50 years, we have done it in this way. We are going to continue doing it the same way. Yeah? So we, we managed to convince some <laughs> funders to give us uh, funds to do this. And it was a multi center country, uh, study in four countries, 7,000 patients compared to culture. And then we found that if you do a uh, spot spot in the first day, you, and you end up with 97% of the patients, 98% of them, with a diagnosis. Yeah? If you don't do that, you miss. If you ask the patients to come on the second day, spot morning, or to ask them three samples, you lose a lot of them. OK, so of course, well, many of these things, you end up saying, OK, these are the equivalents between same day and spot morning. Yeah? And you have to publish this, because the evidence needs to be peer review and so on. So we did a publications and then systematic reviews and so on. And then we reviewed the, those definitions, those very uh, rigid definitions that were there. So can we reduce the number of smears? We said, that, yeah, we can reduce it to two. And, but at the moment, you still have that a positive smear 
is one that has at least 10 bacilli. But this is a very, this is a very specific test. So <coughs> if you reduce the number of bacilli, do we have more, 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 any more false positives? And again, we did a, 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 at the same time a, within this clinical trial an evaluation of whether that's, that's necessary or not. And actually, if you find one bacilli instead of 10, it was the same. The, sense, the specificity was the same. So then we realized that you really don't need two that are positive. You only need one. And you, in each one of those positives, you only need to have one bacilli. So it is actually, that was, this is what is now the guideline from, from WHO. Okay, so that was really 10 years ago. But then at the same time came the LED microscopes. So the, the, these, these uh, microscopes are, uh, increase the sensitivity because you can see the shining and also you can uh, uh, examine the sputum faster because it's, a, it's at a lower magnification. But then, at the same time, we found that the, uh, the specificity, the false positives, increases. And increases quite substantially. Sometimes 10% of the cases are false positives. So most of the studies were saying at that time, we are identifying more cases. But when you, when you compare that to culture, really, it's decreasing the specificity. Sometimes the, the gains were really due to a false positives. So it tells Really, if we are going to improve, uh, to increase this, the use of this type of microscopes, you really may need to maintain the, the training, the quality control, and so on. So this was still not the solution. At the same time, there was a push to implement a new technique. And it's, uh, I'm sure that you are all familiar with this. It's liquid culture. Uh, quite a lot of resources were used to uh, implement this. And it's, it's faster, it gives you the results in a couple of weeks, but at the same time it's more expensive, and it's only used in ref labs, in reference laboratories. So the, really for frontline people, for services that diagnose people in the periphery, this is really not a, a, the solution. And in most places these days, it's being replaced by line probe assays. This is a, a molecular technique, which is quite good to the screen people, whether they have drug resistance and so on. But again, it requires DNA extraction. So it's not something that you will use in all the patients. Yeah. OK, so all of us, you can imagine, were quite frustrated by then. Uh, there was then an editorial in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine who says this is, this is a new machine expert. He was uh, announced in 2008. And they said, this is time for a game change. And it, what happens is that this is a, an automated molecular <coughs> diagnostic where the, you just take the sputum sample, you add it with a, something to liquidize it, and, and then after some time you put it in the cartridge. And the cartridge goes into that machine and <coughs> magic in about, in about a, a, an hour you get the results. Yeah? So the time to results already is about two hours. It tells you, oh, this is the solution. This is going to be a game changer. It's going to increase the sensitivity of the test is going to facilitate diagnostics. We are going to increase the number of people who are diagnosed. The only problem is that it's 10 times more expensive and it requires electricity and it requires maintenance and, and the logistic uh, structure for this. So WHO had learned the lessons by then with the, with the culture and all, all many other techniques and then they say we are going to give it endorsement but that endorsement is conditional of conducting implementation studies. What are the logistics that we need to learn? And how are we going to demonstrate there is an impact on patients? Does it, does it increase detection? And then also the first uh, cartridges will cost 60 euros per sample. And therefore, then they say, well, if we're going to multiply this by millions, you really need to reduce that price. So there was a, what is called a, a type price mechanism. So that's a little bit of, of, of uh, Oliver is doing, or will be doing the next five years. Yeah. So why, why is that WHO endowment import, important? Most tests purchased by countries to diagnose GB are, are really funded by international organizations. Eh? So the Global Fund, Unitaid, PEPFA, USAID, and so on. Yeah? And to be able to qualify for that, they need to be endorsed. Yeah? 
So that's a process that is fairly well defined for tuberculosis. Yeah. So how do you do that? So the, the initially is that if you have a new platform, a new diagnostic that you want to go through the process, you generate the initial evidence. Usually, the, you do the, you test the technology and you develop your own studies. And once the technology is locked, you then go on to do more studies that are usually either sponsored by the manufacturer or ideally independent. Uh, and then you, you develop more evaluations. Yeah? So you publish it, as, as it was in the previous one. And then those, uh, you start to generate uh, evidence, share the databases, and then link up with the WHO uh, 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 staff and you say, well, there is, this platform might be interesting, have a look. And then they, they will eventually ask you to uh, generate uh, systematic reviews. Yeah? So or WHO uh, asks another group to, gen to, to do systematic reviews. OK, so once, once this review is ready, WHO will convene a scientific advisory panel. So that's a group of scientists that will come together and they, the evidence will be presented to them. There will be a discussion on what the main scientific and logistical aspects for this platform. And that, that will then end up with a, res, uh, uh, a decision. So if there is enough evidence to uh, go to the next stage, they will present this, this, all this information to the scientific and te technical advisory group. There is a, a larger group, but there are many other stakeholders, policy makers, national programs and so on. And then they, they discuss whether this is a, a appropriate and they will develop guidelines. So these draft guidelines and they're presented to all these large scale funders. And then if they accept it, okay, it goes to be part of the, of the procurement that you could request from the country. Yeah? So the countries then make a plan and in the next year in the budget that they request to the Global Fund or USID, they can apply for this diagnostic test. Yeah. So this is the process. It's quite long. It's very structured. It may take <coughs> five, seven, ten years, but it's, it's what to do. But the only thing that is here is that at the end, it says the endorsement is, is WHO said, evidence of impact. And the endorsement was given without that evidence of impact. Yeah? So many countries started to procure experts on a large scale of hundreds of thousands of cartridges. But we didn't really have evidence of, of, of really uh, evi evidence of, of impact. And I'm sure that you are familiar with this scheme. How do you evaluate a new diagnostic? And uh, usually you, you compare your new test to a reference standard in TB's culture ideally with two cultures. And then we enroll con uh, patients consecutively in cross-sectional surveys. And we assess the sensitivity and specificity blindly against the, the reference standard. So this is fairly straightforward in, 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 uh, in print, at least. And then you try to assess it in different settings and lower, medium, and high prevalence. This is a cost-effectiveness analysis. Uh, and, and then you see what is the logistics require for, for, for these new diagnostics. So ideally, you will demonstrate that there is a higher number of cases detected and a higher number of cases cured. But most of studies will end up up to here. And they hardly ever end up demonstrating this evidence. OK, so then, so what was the impact of experts? So we will say this is a new very highly sensitive test. We have been waiting for a long time. So there were two studies that were fairly large that were commissioned in two different settings. So, and they were published uh, maybe a couple of years ago. And it says that um, the one was in the Lancet, the other one also in, in PLOS Medicine. And both studies concluded very well. They compared this new method that they say was rapid, it was uh, automated, it will, reduce, it will reduce the, the number of uh, the manpower that you require. And it compared to a smear microscopy, which for a long time nobody wanted to use anymore. The study says there were a higher number of patients that were confirmed. Yeah, so that's good. But the number of patients treated for TB was the same in both groups. I said, how come? And the number of, 
of uh, the number of cases, the num overall number of cases treated in that area was exactly the same. Yeah? So what happens is that over uh, the last half a century, we have been saying we're going to, do, to examine your sputum, and while the result comes, we're going to start treatment for you. Yeah? And then, of course, when the, when the result comes, it says, oh yes, you continue your treatment, it's, it's correct, you have TB. But if the test comes back negative, people will say, well, we already started treatment, so you better continue and see how it goes. <laughs> yeah? So in that case, we should have saved that money and those resources and that time, so there is no impact, really. There has been, there was, in the, many of the studies, so that really there is no impact. And uh, you may have seen many, this is available in many of the, in fine, in WHO and so on. There is a diagnostic pipeline. What is there in the future? And I just realized recently, this, I should get a, the most updated one. There's another one up to, for the next three or four years. But if you see here, is so if you are familiar with this diagnostic pipeline, there are two things. First is that this is full of ghosts by now, because 90, 95% of these platforms have failed by now. So we, we don't have a rapid diagnostic test that is easy to use. Most of them first failed when we were evaluating. And the second is that you, if you see anything from there, is that you see a lot of machines. You see a lot of electricity. You need a lot of requirements in the lab. So we are still far away from having a, a diagnostic that is a point of care that is easy to use. So, many platforms require really a lab, yeah, are far from the patient's sleep, and are really geared to high sensitivity and specificity. But they are really not suitable for the point of care where the, where the people access the services. And really, a diagnostic test, if you think of that, of, of that the patient must have come already to the health service. And this is an example of Nigeria. Nigeria did a national survey, and they realized in the national survey that going house to house, they were only identifying 15% of the people who had TB. They are missing 85%. So if you put it in a graph like this, we are using the diagnostic test in the second bar, here. So if you want to increase case detection, really the answer is not on the second stage. It's much more earlier on. We need to move our services much more down the scale, down to the left. Yeah. OK, so it's really more a health system problem, access into health systems. And then once we have sorted that, then say, where do we put the diagnostics? Should we use one or two? So we, what is the diagnostic algorithm that we should use and so on. So that's a little bit of what we have been trying to do m more recently. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of, of what I, we are doing at this stage. And sorry for the uh, spelling there, it's southern region. So this is Ethiopia. Ethiopia is uh, an, a country that is developing rapidly. It's uh, one of the uh, economies in, uh, in Africa that is really uh, growing. But at the same time, in the southern region, 90% of the population is rural. And on a high proportion of them find it very difficult to reach the country, the, the services. So we decided to do, uh, 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 to test at something. Because the, the government realized that it was difficult for people to access the services, they created what is the health extension program. For every village, they, test, they train two uh, health extension workers, which are salaried, and they live in the village, they are trained for three years, and then they run the local health post. But most importantly, they visit the households every, every, they have to visit every household every two weeks, and then do some basic health packages. They do immunization, they can give treatment for malaria, and they, they have somebody who has cough, they refer them to the health center. If they may think they have HIV, they refer them for HIV testing. Yeah? So the activities that they do locally were working very well. Ethiopia achieved the Millennium Development Goals. But the activities where they had to refer the patients, 
they were not working very well. There were case detection for TB was not increasing. <coughs> so we trained the, the health workers. We, we asked them how to identify people with, who may have TB, basically who had a chronic cough. And then we, they collected sputum. And then they, we showed them how to prepare a smear. Back to the old smear microscopy. I'm really sorry, but I still think that, that in some places it may still be appropriate. So they did the smear microscopy, and then they, they uh, phoned a, a person who will come in a motorbike, and that person will take this, this sputum to the health center so, uh, to, to do the smear microscopy. So at the same time, he, collect, he will collect some information because the government says, Unless we have the name of the patient who is going to be treated, you cannot start treatment. Yeah? So this, this person will go to the village, and then they will collect the name of the person with the sputum, age, and so on, and then we'll take this, the sputum to the, to the health center. If it is positive, then they will go to the health center and say, I have this patient with these details, register the patient in the health center, and bring the treatment at home. And they start treatment at home. So our cost really is the transport of the sputum and bringing the sputum some back as well because the health extension worker is already there. It's part of the health system in, 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 in Ethiopia. And uh, so then the health extension worker will follow the patient for the next six months. And if they have any problem, they, they then send back the, the message and they will get some technical support. Okay, so I'm going to show you what happened. And this is from uh, stop TB, and it will last for about three or four minutes. <laughs> Tuberculosis kills 1.4 million people every year. The disease is curable, but efforts to find and treat people with TB have stagnated. For the past six years, a third of the people who got sick with TB have gone without an accurate diagnosis or effective treatment. With this level of coverage, it's not surprising that so many people die from TB and that drug resistance is on the rise. TB Reach, funded by a $120 million grant from Canada, aims to reverse this trend. This is how we do it. TB Reach provides seed funding for local solutions to local problems. Here is an example. In rural Ethiopia, Health facilities can be a full day's travel away from remote villages. This is one reason why thousands of people a year don't get the TB care they need. But these rural communities also have a great resource to tap into. Across the country, the government employs 40,000 health extension workers to provide basic health services to their communities. Until recently, many of these health workers didn't have the skills or equipment to provide TB services. That all changed when they were selected for a TB Reach grant in 2011. With seed funding from TB Reach, the health workers began to visit people in their homes, collect sputum from those with TB symptoms, and deliver the test samples to laboratories far from the community's reach. The project employed 1,200 health workers, covering 3.3 million people in Ethiopia's Sadama zone. This is what happened to TB case detection after the TV Reach project started. As well as delivering impressive results, the project has empowered these health workers. By connecting people with proper testing and treatment, they know they provide a real service to their communities. What happened next? The National TV Program and the Global Fund found out about the project and wanted to learn more. Now the approach pioneered by TB Reach is set to be rolled out across Ethiopia, bringing quality TB care to many thousands more. TB Reach's success in incubating innovative approaches has been replicated all around the world. Other projects have made local innovations with equally impressive results. TB Reach grantees used mobile phones to screen patients in private facilities and deliver incentive-based payments in Karachi, placed hundreds of LED microscopes in medical colleges across India, and were the first to use gene expert technology to improve TB diagnosis in many countries. Overall, TB Reach grantees have detected over 400,000. Okay, so I'll just, this is available in here if you, if you want to see the rest. It's, a couple, it's only a few minutes more. 
But then that show up to the first two years, and then there is an another learning curve on how to upscale. So they went from uh, three million population to seven million population. And what we found is that over the years, there was a decrease of 9% per year. So we went to see, is that fatigue? Is that uh, because people are, start, uh, are we decreasing the prevalence of TB, the incidence of TB and so on? So we, we are now looking into this. Is, is that because finally we found a way that we are looking so intensively uh, and really at the community level that we have found that we can decrease and so on. So if you see the proportion of cases that are, the, the, the incidence in many of the places is going down, but it's going down by one or two percent. It has never very rarely reached 10 percent. Only on the, after the Second World War there was a reduction like this. And also, more importantly, something that we found is that do you give the treatment at home? These are our treatment success rates. Yeah? And we found that the treatment success was 92 percent. So if somebody working here and on and all the other infectious diseases, you might say this is not so high. What we observe in many other places, the treatment success is about 80%. So this is one of the highest reported. So treatment at home is very important to ensure that the people take the treatment. So this, is, this was just published last week. It was discussed at the Global Fund. So we had the, uh, discussions of uh, the Ethiopia had a, a grant to upscale this. And is, uh, we, we will learn many other lessons and the operational. Okay, Nigeria, as mentioned before, it has the largest uh, population in, in Africa. It has the second largest burden of TB. But unfortunately, it doesn't have the health extension workers, the extensions that we, I show in Ethiopia. So we tried that, but they, they, it doesn't work because there is no basic health extension workers. Or well, if they are, they are not really very functional. So we, I work with colleagues in Sankli Medical Center, Sankli Research Laboratory, and then we say, well, can we try something else? So, and something that is very uh, common in these areas is that uh, uh, in Abuja, which is a plant city, everything looks very nice outside, uh, inside Abuja, but when you go outside, you realize that the people who work in Abuja commute, and many of them are uh, low-paid civil servants. They live in ex very extended slum areas. Abuja officially has a population of one and a half million, and there's about four million commuting from outside every day. Yeah. And so the motorways, there are six lanes, five, four lanes motorways coming into the city, crowded in the morning and again in the evening. So they all live in these very large slums. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a population that is not very far away, but it's in areas where they are, they are not planned, there are no health services there. Yeah. So, we said, well, when, when you see, when you ask the people, where do they get the health services or uh, medical advice? They say, we always get it from the local medical <coughs> medi medicine shop, the private medicine vendors. Yeah? So we said, could we just really enroll them? So they are really small shops. They are within the slums and they are registered. They can sell medicines as long as the medicines are are, are uh, registered as well. So, so we engaged them in the, in the last uh, uh, six months and said, could they facilitate increasing case detection? Well, so what are we asking them? So this is, this is Abuja, and you see this is Nigeria. You see this is a, a, a very large country. I don't know if you can see these lines, but this is the metropolitan area, if I can point it from here to here. Uh, so driving from one side to the other it takes about 40, 50 minutes. And then this is the next stage, and there is a, the next state, and there is a very large uh, a, a motorway here that then after this becomes a two lane, and then here a one lane, and so on. If you see a, if you see a, a, a map from Google, so you find that here, this is the plain area, nice housing, and so on. But here, all this area here, there are slums. There, they probably have recalculate between two and four million people. Yeah. And they don't have health services there. Or if they do, they're private practitioners, or they are, and there are a few uh, health services now that are beginning to, to appear, but they are much more um, basic here. 
Okay, so we, invi we invited the private medics, they're called in PMVs, the, uh, the private medical uh, vendors, and we train them exactly similar to what we did in Ethiopia. We, we say, if you identify people who have cough for two weeks, and you ask them to invite them to send one sputum sample, we will give you one dollar for each, yeah? So, okay, and we map them, and we visit them, uh, then we, there is a, a, a team that is going to the five uh, health extension workers that we have trained, and they go and visit them. And then every time they find um, one person who has come to us for a, a syrup for cough, a, a cough syrup, then they say, well, they can do whatever they do. We are not going to change the practice. But we ask them, could you, in addition, ask them for one sputum sample? We think that if we find, collect the sample very quickly, we test it very quickly, and we feedback very quickly, we can still find the patient very near, yeah? So we have a, a team of people with motorbikes. It's a densely populated area. Many of them are really very, it's back, back, uh, passes. it's very difficult to get to those places, but in motorbikes they can. So they collect the sputum samples the same day. We have, at this stage, 50 shops. Yeah, so we was really trying to see what happened, and we take them to one laboratory that we equipped. They has ex gene expert machines, and they are they, they, these are four. We have another two uh, at the back, so we can test uh, um, a, a good number up to 60 samples per day. Yeah, and we have a team that is ready to prepare to do that. Yeah, so what happens if if the test is positive? We only do one test this time. We send an SMS to the patient to say the, your result is, is ready and is, you have to go and get treatment. We cannot say you have TB, but we can say do this and this and that. And this is where you have to go. We also send a, a, a message to the PMV who very gladly says, oh, oh good, because if it is positive, I'll get $2. Yeah? <laughs> and then we send a, a, an SMS to the health center saying, this patient is going to come to register to you. Once they are done, an hour later, the uh, uh, two in the region will say, uh, have you received your, have you sent your message? Is it clear? We are going to come to you to come, and we are going to, they arrange where they are going to meet, yeah? If it is negative, then it has a set of instructions if you continue to be ill and so on, what to do next. We aim to start treatment in 24 hours. Yeah, so everybody said that's unrealistic because we, the target usually is to start treatment within 28 days, about 80% of the patients. Okay, so we had tested in the first four months 2,400 patients. We have found 120 cases and 90% of them are linked to treatment. So you say, okay, how, how does it happen? So this is the PMV. Uh, in the center, and on to, the, to his right is the most handsome person that you could ever see. It's me, but you, in the in the so. so this is our supervisor, the motorbike, and the person from the lab. So this is really the team, and we have a health information officer. So um, these are the health centers where we register. They are near nearby. Yeah, yeah. And then this is the, the staff in the health center, and this is the person coming to register for treatment the next day. Okay, so what happened is that we really just started uh, uh, a few months ago, and this is the background of the last four years in both an, an area without the intervention and an area with the, inter with the intervention. <coughs> and this curve here is going at the same speed that we find in Ethiopia. Yeah? There are lots of cases there, the people who eat TB, that they, we had not identified before. <clears throat> so, what is different here is that we have then found that we are doing expert, is more sensitive than, than smear microscopy. We are using that technology, but we are trying to use, take advantage that is a bit rapid and that we can do a lot of tests. And we don't have to wait, worry about the quality because it's automated. But at the same time, we find that if you see here, the people, when we started the first month, 10% were positive. There were a lot of cases there that never accessed the health services. And then after that, the positivity went down 7%, 7%. Mm -hmm. 
and the fourth one, 4%, and now is 1%. So it seems that we have cleaned that backlog, and we have now an area that there are not so many cases. So if we only find 1%, this is not cost effective, it's too expensive. Yeah? Okay, so this is really what, what we are up to now. So there are large number of undiagnosed cases. The PMBs were, are very enthusiastic, really they continue to collect samples. It's a rapid detection that the rapid turnover allows us to link people to treatment fairly well. And then, but there is a decrease in positivity. So what we are going to do now is to then experiment with this method where we are going to start. We are now here in this area in New Cairo. So the, in January, we start in the neighboring area. <coughs> and then we are already planning where the other areas, continuous areas, which we are monitoring. We are building up <coughs> a, a waste design in, into this intervention. Yeah? Of course, what the question is, when do we go back to the first, question, to the first area? Uh, of course, in the second year, in this type of programs, the idea is that you don't only prove the concept, but also you need to scale up. So this is going to be replicated in other places. And then we're doing cost-effectiveness cost studies. Remember, this is, could be a, a, an academic exercise. You may show that it works. It gives you a very good intervention. It gives you a very good paper. But it, if it is not taken up by the policymakers, by the funders, by the programs, by the communities, it doesn't really make a difference. It will be only a paper in your CV. So it's very important that you, the programs, the national programs need to own this. Yeah? They need to be part of this process. So in, this, in these studies, we always have the national program coordinator, the, sta the state coordinator, the focal person, the community representatives in our meetings. Yeah? Because they need to they say, this is what is happening. This is the information we are collecting. What do you think what you do next? And that decision making, this, this, this communication, this cooperation, is what really ensures that you, you, can, you can really uh, start to plan how are you going to include this activity into the routine activities of the programs. So I think uh, um, I'm going to stop here. So I think that just, I started by talking about diagnostics. And I think saying that we really had very poor diagnostics and we still don't have very, poor di very good diagnostics. But I think the important is that how do we address those bottlenecks that prevent people from using them, or accessing them, and how do we link that, that information to decision making, that this in a way is rapid enough to prevent people continue to do what we have all done for the last 50 years. So technologies, I think, can have an impact, but that impact only happens if you prepare the content, if you understand what are the barriers to introduce these technologies and how they are appropriate to the context where they, you are using them. Thank you very much. I will